playing this game just like it's work. I'm a nine to five. I got chores to share, so let's start from the top, man. Looking at my gear, and I still need a bop. That's BOP. I think you know what I mean. I'm talking blade of prophecy. Uh, just show me the beam, please. RNG or maybe RNG. This is all I want, but he won't believe us. And then it's like, man, this thing exists. Is it on this freaking list? Uh, Mr. Shard, don't play on hard. Oh God, what drop did I just miss? Got a grind for classes, got a grind for gear. It's 2.2, man. It's time to care. I mean, crazy stories. Got to get the glory. I'll play all night until the morning light. Get caffeined up, man. You'll be all right. Switch the flow on. I'll leave you with this, man. Actions, not words. Cause all of this talking and these posts, absurd. Without numbers to prove it, man, just shut up and do it, man. West March Workshop, let's get back to the truest. That's how we do it, yeah. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Had to, I had to get the flow on him real quick. Mm-hmm. Real quick. That... I don't know, you know, I always go and comment how I'm not able to ever touch, like, Leviathan's openings, but that just makes me not even want to try anymore. <laughs> that, one, that one is, I've just given up. Oh, man. No, I actually, you know, I was re-listening to last week's episode, and I, uh, because whenever you're doing the intro, like, I'm, I'm not even, I don't even know if I should admit this, but I'm, like, not really listening as hard as I should be, because <laughs> I'm mostly just waiting for you to finish, so I know, like, to cue the lowering of the music and flipping the scenes. Don't want to miss my cue. Uh, but I went back and listened to it, and I was actually rather moved by it. So I oh. think I think we both have our strengths. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I'm actually preparing one for the uh, Diablo 3 anniversary. Whoa. Way in advance. Because when, yeah, when we did the Reaper of Souls opening, I came across this perfect speech, and it fit marvelously with just like, the commentary from the community and everything I'm going through and I'm writing it, I'm like, wait, this just fits better if I take it back to the original and not Reaper of Souls. So I had to put that off to the side and then start from scratch like an hour before the show. <laughs> I've, I've got a good one now. I've got a good one now. Dude, I'm excited, man. I'm mm -hmm. excited. Uh, you have a month and a half to like really craft it too. Yeah, yeah. And in, in speaking of uh, being excited, we've got some exciting things to talk about this show. Oh, man. Yes, we do. So let's formally welcome everyone, of course, to uh, episode 44, One Year at the Workshop. What? Yeah. Who would have known when you started this thing, Mr. Nineball, with your good old buddy, Archon the Wizard, that you would actually make it one whole year? If you know, if you had asked us a year ago, not the either of us, I can tell you that, because <laughs> it was it was just one of those things. You know, it was um, we were writing the hype of the expansion, and it's something that we had talked about for a while before that. Um, and it was just you know, it was like, is is there room really for a Diablo podcast? So there really wasn't wasn't a lot going on at the time. There was a uh, Shattered Soulstone and. Um, the uh, Ink Gamers podcast that you and I had both been on, and we had the special guest uh, Flux last week, mm -hmm. you know, um, from the, that podcast. It was just, you know, it's like, would would it gain any interest, you know, really whatsoever? And what are we gonna what are we gonna have to talk about? And there was a lot of, that we were going on and going back and forth, you know. It's like, how are we gonna fill content for a show, you know? Because we we go a couple months between getting any type of updates or PTRs or content patches and right. Well, lo and behold, here we are a year later, <laughs> a two-hour podcast every single week in between content patches. So, right. yeah, what can, what can I say? No, man, it's it's pretty insane when you think about it. And so at 44 episodes at one year means we only missed eight, which isn't too bad. Not not too bad at all. In the grand scheme of things. So mm -hmm. I guess our, and, our goal for the next year should be to miss four or something. Aim yeah. high. <laughs> so yeah, cut it definitely. in half. Yeah, cause remember what is it three of those uh, three of those weeks that we missed so almost half the weeks that we missed was because you know um i was laid up for a while there oh truth truth yeah so we have le we have legit reasons mm -hmm. yeah no i think uh i think it's awesome and i actually like i was telling you uh previous to the show and i'll say it here so it's on record i was watching the very first episode at work today and it was amazing just listening to what you guys were talking about kind of tied into last week's episode of um capturing one year of reaper of souls but the issues that were uh at hand at that time there were like exploits on people killing rats mm -hmm. chess, chess farming was still a thing um mm -hmm. you guys were talking about kadala and if that was in fact her name which is hilarious because <laughs> who could forget it now yeah who could forget it now but in our defense the game was out you know the game was out for a week literally for a <laughs> week because it was april 2nd yeah yeah 
but it was just it was awesome to see you know some of the stuff that you guys were also prognosticating in terms of talking about what seasons would look like what greater rifts would look like and a lot of it was spot on so if any of you listening haven't uh, gone back and checked out some of the earlier episodes i highly recommend it um it's over on archon's youtube channel so that would be archon infernal friday if you're searching on youtube mm-hmm. and and I, I guarantee you will have some laughs and also just like be mildly intrigued at what were issues you know way back when and how far we honestly have come in the, such a short time yeah one of one of the things you mentioned when we were talking before the show is just we were talking we were discussing greater seasons you know were just you know a, a twinkle in the milkman's eye as it were you know mm-hmm. it just the seasons had just been announced the week prior at the at the launch of reaper and we were kind of thinking, well, what could they do to entice people to come and play in a season? And like one of the ideas that was thrown around was just, you know, seasonal items, season-only items. And you know, it's funny how you know that, that's one of those little ones that kind of came through. Yep, came to came to fruition. Yeah. Oh man, and I actually do want to talk about some of the seasonal items uh, in a news post that we have for later. But like you were saying before, before I just had to get the formal intro and a little bit of nostalgia out there, we have exciting announcements. Yep, very exciting announcements. Um, first, I, th- I feel that we should open uh, with the contest that we've been running the past couple of weeks um, to go through. And we're giving away a signed copy of the Reaper of Souls Collector's Edition uh, in celebration of the Reaper of Souls one year anniversary. Uh, this is something that Steven's actually giving away from his, you know, this is his, you know, personal item that he got, you know, uh, from uh, the contest back at the Reaper launch. And we asked people to go through and submit in stories. You know, what what was your favorite moment playing Reaper of Souls? And, you know, we, we got we got some entries and we went through them and we kind of picked our favorite. Yes, indeed. Uh, we have one here. I actually want to read it in full. It's it's a little long, and I'll I'll be quick as I read it. But I think it's a really kind of heartwarming story, uh, one that really captured the spirit of of Reaper of Souls of perse- perseverance. Um, kind of you know the the dev team making their way through and coming out with a great expansion and kind of save the game, if you will, in quotes. Um, mm-hmm. I kind of get that sense from this. So this is kind of why it went out for both of us. We really enjoyed it. Um, and we also will uh, mention some honorable mentions from other entries as well, because there were some good ones. All right, so this is uh, Thomas Sorensen. Congratulations, you won the contest. And his story goes something like this. Sup, fellas. Before I tell my story, I just want to say that I'm a huge fan of the show and have had an amazing experience in the Blizz Pro clan since I joined a couple weeks ago. The clan and the community has been amazing and extremely welcoming. And for the contest, I wanted to tell you guys a story of how I started Diablo since I'm extremely new and just joined up this year. For years, I've been a fan of Blizzard's games, but had only played World of Warcraft. I'd heard my friends play Diablo for several years and listened in on them playing Diablo 3 in early days of release. The game had always sounded fun, but I'd never tried it as often uh, as I had often had to choose only a few games to play at a time and split my gaming time between WoW and console. Over time, my vision deteriorated due to my condition and I had a difficult time playing most games. In my group of friends, I had always been known as the blind player, and depending on my role, the blind tank or blind healer. When I started college, I took a break from online gaming in order to focus on my education, career, and social life, but it always stayed up to date with the latest gaming news, largely thanks to BlizzPro. After re-entering the world of online gaming with the release of Hearthstone, I had begun to gain an interest in D3. For quite a while, I had talked with my friends about joining them on Diablo and my friends knowing my visual limits told me that I would not be able to accomplish much in the game, but they would carry me along nonetheless. So I pushed the ideas aside for a while, thinking they were probably right and not wanting to make them carry me through another game. In November 2014, my best friend convinced me I should try out the game as season one was going to end and would offer some cool transmog gear and achievements for completing it. So after a week of persuasion, I decided to give it a shot, but decided that if I was going to get involved, I should go all in. So I scoured the web in search of collector's edition of Diablo 3 and was discouraged upon discovering $400 to $600 price tag uh, that most sites are offering. For nearly two months, I searched the web for a more affordable option and miraculously in early January, I came across a reasonably priced D3 collector's edition, put an eBay bid down of $150 and awaited for the results. Astonishingly, I won the auction and became increasingly excited to start playing. 
Only two weeks were left in the season, and I anxious, anxiously hoped I'd be able to play this game effectively enough to get a character leveled and complete the campaign in time before the season ended. I knew I was years and a whole expansion behind my friends with the game, but I prepared myself to give it everything I had, even though the fear that I had wasted so much money on a game I may not be capable of playing loomed in the back of my mind. The first few days were very difficult. After making my first character a demon hunter named Donovan, an AQ reference, I realized that my goal of playing the game authentically without any power leveling or boosts would be far more difficult than I expected. I was thrilled to discover the game was perfectly oriented and graphically designed in a way that worked with my vision, which meant I was capable of at least fighting enemies and avoiding damage at an acceptable skill level. Unfortunately, there was a major problem I had encountered. I wasn't able to read the text or numbers on my items or even see some of the items in my bags. For my first week in D3, it had become necessary to have my friends watch my games while in Skype, and uh, we played so that they could tell me which direction to move my mouse and when slash where to click in order to do simple things like sell items or stash materials. Despite being discouraged with my ability to play without assistance, I loved the game and became enthralled by the history, lore, and overall story of Diablo. Determined to make it work, I spent one of my days off from work and school adjusting display and graphic settings, trying out new display cables, and memorizing the locations of important NPCs in the game. I was thrilled to discover that I had accomplished my goal and was now able to maneuver the game far easier and more efficiently than before. For the remaining week of the season, I conquered many of my goals, I reached level 70, completed the campaign, and got many of the are uh, getting each of my item slots equipped with a legendary item or set item. In the last day of the season, my friends logged in to do their last minute task and they were amazed that I had accomplished so much in my weeknights playing and especially that I had done it all by myself. It was one of the best experiences in gaming that I had in years due to my horrible vision. That night was amazingly fun because I was finally able to play a game on equal footing with my friends, which I had been unable to do for years. At the end of the season one, I had managed to surpass a few of my friends who had been playing Diablo for years. I reached Paragon 40 and luckily snagged some great legendaries. And now we're at the end of Season 2, which has been an amazingly fun experience as well, despite its shortness. I'm accomplishing so much in the game, uh, despite being legally blind. I managed to play roughly 2 hours a night, and have just reached my goal of getting my Season 2 Crusader to Paragon 100, and I'm only one piece away from reaching my final season goal of a 6-piece Akon set. Diablo is one of my favorite games of all time now, and I can't wait to see what's next, and can't wait to go back and play all the Diablo I missed from Diablo 1 and 2. So, that's awesome. That's the story. It, it really is that that one is like touching, you know. It's like something like that. You you when you know if you set it up in the the pretext, you know, someone's most favorite moment in playing Diablo is you know reaching Paragon level forty. You know, it's like that doesn't seem like it's a lot, but this mm -hmm. this is like like a real accomplishment for someone that has you know just like one of those things that we take for granted so much our vision and being able to like enjoy the game and just take those little thing is where's my mouse cursor I mean, people joke you know and you lose it and yeah. like, all the laser light show that's going on but just imagine what that is when you have a, a visual disability for sure and just overcoming the adversity like even wanting you know the game in its original settings it's easy to just be discouraged and say oh i can't play this game you know mm -hmm. but going back further and, and saying i still want to make it work i'm going to try everything you know, use different cables. Like I just, that's awesome, man. So inspired me for sure. Um, and hopefully inspired many people that hear it and congrats, man. Mm -hmm. Congrats. So please uh, uh, send us your, uh, your information, uh, shoot us an email over at Westmark's workshop at uh, blizzpro.com. And so that way we can go and get that shipped out to you. Absolutely. I'll get on that as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And if it, uh, and if you are outside the U S um yeah I expect it a little bit little bit longer a little bit longer just a little bit of a longer wait uh -huh. and if you're on the moon with archon well then it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna take some time i have to send it to florida first to get on the uh space shuttle yeah we have to send it over here first send it to jupiter and then i'll take it to cape canaveral to get to the moon but um yes there it is <laughs> uh but um now speaking of archon we actually tried to get him on tonight's show Yes, we did. Yeah. We recognized it is a one-year anniversary, and it would have been so sweet to have uh, one of the founding members of the podcast back. But he's a busy man. He is a busy man. Yeah, he had uh, travel. What was it? Travel plans? He was going out of town um, this week. He was just going to be gone. Yeah, I believe he said he was uh, more interstellar space plans. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of that zero gravity stuff will take its toll and... 
he just had to uh had to keep his mission going yeah yeah and you know being being on the moon he also admitted that his uh his knowledge of what's up to date in the uh the game is a little bit lacking as it was yep. um <laughs> yeah I guess I guess to kind of fill in for that, not as a special guest tonight, but we I guess the the other uh, announcement that we have to follow that one up with is we, we will be having a special guest um, in a couple weeks uh, mm-hmm. on April fifteenth. We we got someone that will be uh, joining the show. Um, what was his name again? Oh, uh, let me see if I can pull that email up. I can't remember offhand. Um, I think. Uh... He's involved with Diablo a little bit, in yeah. Ten, you know, he's, behind he's the kind, scenes. Yeah, he he has kind of a presence in the community. Yeah, he posts on Reddit sometimes. Uh, it's not it's not that Menegis guy again, right? No, no, we already had him on the show. He was already there. You're looking at the wrong email. Oh, okay, okay. Let me scroll up. Oh, that's right. Wyatt Cheng is going to be coming on the show. No big deal no big deal but <laughs> yes oh my gosh so excited get hyped we're super um, stoked we are super excited on this one um but yeah so so uh save the date april 15th so while you're sitting in line uh the digital line trying to go and get your blizzcon tickets uh just have the stream open uh, we'll be going through and uh we're we'll going through and having a uh, wyatt on the show it's not really gonna be like a like a a hardline Q and A session that you see like with a lot of the other developer interviews. Right. He's actually going to be like a special guest on the show, kind of like uh, Flux and Menegis were. That he's going to be here, you know, for the majority of the show. For the almost we right now is planning on the full two hours, but it kind of depends on schedules and stuff like that. It can still change. We're just going to be here to talk about what's going on, what's current. Um, season three will have just launched a few days uh, prior to that, and just some uh, thoughts and feelings on. What what seasons mean, you know, like where they're going forward and such. But it's going to be a lot more, a lot more of uh, just kind of like a, not like just conversation. Laid, laid back, casual convo, similar mm-hmm. to what we always do here. You know, we'll just kind of kick it around some different topics, mm-hmm. you know, work on, talk about each other's week in gaming stuff. We can see what a week in gaming looks like for Wyatt. And we'll, yeah. we'll hopefully topics will just kind of spawn off from there. Yeah, definitely. Looking looking forward to it. So, um, if you've ever been shy about submitting feedback or questions, you know, probably that would be that would be the episode that you'd want to throw throw some emails over at us because we'll we'll be doing you know feedback. Uh, Matt, we should have Wyatt go through and pick the items of the week. <laughs> that would be awesome, actually. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, or, or like, if there's a reroll question, like Wyatt, what would you reroll on this? <laughs> what would you reroll? Yeah. So yeah, look um, forward to that, guys. This would be really awesome. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we we are definitely hyped. We're happy to go through and be able to announce that one. Uh, so definitely look forward to it. Uh, so excited. So excited. Absolutely. Much wow. <laughs> it almost makes going into the rest of this regular old news feel kind of old hat at this point, you know? We need, yeah. we need more, like, we need April Fool's type news to kick things off here i don't know if you have yeah. anything like that for us Ah, uh, maybe is it april fools it is april fools but that last segment none of that which you just heard yeah. by the way was an you april know, fools joke yeah thinking back on it when i was putting the show notes together i did not think of it putting these two things together in form of our flow of topic conversation but um, i now see that that was probably a slight error <laughs> Uh, just as long as they didn't stop listening they don't they, yeah you know <laughs> uh all right but no definitely yes wyatt real april fools from this point on yes. um so let's see some of the th- some of the big some of the big things that uh blizzard had going on i liked one of the things that one of my favorites probably wasn't actually something that blizzard did was actually something that was done in the community um anywhere that you go that discusses Diablo 3 obviously is going to have people coming in and chiming about uh, Path of the Exile. You know, whether you want to listen to it or not, Mikey, <laughs> um, there's going to be always things going on about that. But this time, the edit, the moderators of the Diablo subreddit in the Path of Exile subreddit switched. So if you go to you know our Diablo, 
you're going to Path of Exile. They went through, <laughs> they changed the uh, the theme, they're posting Path of Exile news, and then the, the Path of Exile team switched it up. So if you go over there, you're now seeing Diablo. That's pretty, pretty sweet stuff. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think I do have it up here. Let's take a look. Whoops, that is an email. <laughs> All right, yeah, here's the... Uh, I'm actually on the Diablo already, I promise you. Mm -hmm. But it's actually Path of Exile type stuff going on here. Yep. And this will actually allow us to dive into a real topic. Speaking of Wyatt Cheng, uh, he went and commented on Reddit. I don't know if you guys knew that there was this sort of thing going on in the community. I don't believe we touched on it previously. But some people were noticing that the way that pylons were spawning in Greater Rifts had a bit of a pattern to them. Uh, basically what occurs is you can get every single pylon uh, in one rift and it tries to guarantee that scenario for you and so what happens is that as you explore the map in a greater rift based on the progression that you've made in terms of killing monsters and moving your bar up uh, a great or a pylon is very likely to spawn and what you can do actually is go ahead and explore the entire map don't kill anything and then if you kill everything on that map you're guaranteeing some pylons to be spawning for you like right at the entrance of the next uh, map when you zone over so some players some crafty players uh took advantage of these game mechanics and made it so that they could actually spawn multiple pylons right before they uh take the rift guardian and bring it into existence in those greater rifts and then you know you have a power pylon you have a conduit and then you know you get your stone singer and that's literally the holy triumvirate right there so mm -hmm. um, people were manipulating this and white decided to chime in and said uh yeah that's a bad thing and we actually have a fix for it, which is going to go live in 2.2. .2. And Nineball, you had an interesting uh, look at this just because you realized it was a bit of a different philosophy from what we had heard before, right? Yeah, I mean, just coming off of the, the Tavern talk from a few weeks ago, they, they were discussing how, you know, the they've a lot of the changes that they made in season one, you know, like they went and pushed through the patch at the end of it. They did hot fixes and things like that. They're not terribly concerned with the legitimacy of the leaderboards it's not something that they want to uh, you know be held to uh, when they're going and developing or balancing the game and so if there's something groundbreaking they want to go in and patch it uh, but this is kind of showing a little bit more restraint in that respect that they, this is something that they do deem as a problem and they've had a fix for over a month now but they've held back on implementing it um, you know, obviously they said that they, they wanted to, they, they felt it was a better fit to put it in with patch 2.2 instead of doing a, a live patch prior, you know, to season three. But that kind of strikes me as one of those things that's kind of like a little nod to we're not going to change up, you know, the meta for the leaderboards, you know, this late into the season right before it ends. Yeah, you know, we're we're gonna, you know, we don't we we want to at least give it just a little bit more time, and then we'll go through and fix it. Yeah, you know, which which is nice. This is one of those things that kind of people you know were asking for. Obviously, yes, this is exploitive gameplay. It it makes it so that way it just goes back to, you know, it's almost like you're fl when you were flipping maps beforehand to just try and find that conduit so mm -hmm. you can clear clear around it. And then finally get the boss to spawn right next to it. Now you have more control over it. You're you know you're controlling your flip, and now the only thing you're looking for is Stone Singer. And you know, so it's nice to see that they're going to go through and change it. But at the same time, they're not going to implement it at the end of a season and make it so that way. Well, the highest greater rifts have all been accomplished already, and nothing is going to change. Right. You know, because going through and using this, it would be very hard to actually beat some of those greater rift achievements you know while not using this method yeah and it's interesting too because uh if you recall from last week at the tavern talk one of the things they did comment on was the sever uh exploit slash bug slash whatever you would like to call it um and how that was hot fixed which is interesting because that could have also resulted in a bit of a taint of the pool in terms of pushing people up into higher greater rifts than they might normally have access to or be able to clear mm -hmm. um yeah so i to, mean sorry go ahead 
I was about to say, to a certain extent, yes. I guess, you know, even though there's not as much focus on the solo leaderboards, that there's even less focus on the group leaderboards. Mm -hmm. And that does, you know, have the ability to get some pretty insane clears and just clear speeds with uh, that that sever marked for death, um, um, you know, combination that they had going on there. But, uh yeah, I, I guess I don't see that one as bad because at that point you might be able to gain like four or five extra levels on you know all of your legendary gems. But you know, were is that something when they fixed it a month ago? You know, are people able to just get to that greater rift now through power creep? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, and I think the main reason I brought it up was just as a bit of juxtaposition, just to say, you know, it's it's interesting what they do have to measure in terms of factors. And it, and if you recall, too, on the show, there was a big sort of debate that they said they were having in the uh, rooms when they gathered everyone who had insight and input on that situation where they were kind of split 50-50. And they said even everyone themselves was kind of split 50-50 on whether to change it. So I think it's it just kind of further goes to show that when these circumstances come up, you know, they are actively discussing them and, and attempting to determine sort of the best recourse in order to maintain the even playing field of the leaderboards which i think is good because oftentimes we hear them say you know we're, we're not balancing the game around the leaderboards that we're not they're not a main focus on how we develop the game etc but it is good to know that they are at least paying attention to sort of the state of the game and how that could possibly affect the leaderboards yeah this this was one of those ones that kind of comes down to that that interaction between developers and players and you know certain certain points it is the developer's job to kind of realize that the players are asking too much or what they're asking for will cross certain lines that will kind of um hinder the legitimacy of the game or the overall play experience and such but this is one of those ones i don't think is that that because the players are really just asking the developers to care a little bit more about like the legitimacy of those leaderboards it's something that's in the game it's something that a lot of people are passionate about and it's just it, it gives like kind of like a good feeling for the community you know obviously if it's something that's like really groundbreaking go in and fix it but if it's just like a little minor thing yeah maybe go and wait till the next content patch to go and fix it and just let that be the outlier within that season you know mm -hmm. yeah and i think that kind of will be the case going forward we'll see sort of the hallmarks you know we'll have those war stories to look back on season one had exploits <laughs> season yeah. two and was super long and then season two was super short and didn't have as many exploits or you know weird things going on so we'll kind of have those uh those moments in history sort of like how we were talking about when we started out the show you go back and you see like oh this was the the topic of discussion in april 2014 and then this was the patch that sort of remedied that fix and so on and so forth mm -hmm. um but yeah I'm, I'm excited for what is to come and with that in mind i actually wanted to skip to the next news point that we had which was a blog went up it and we completely skipped all the other April Fool's Day uh, jokes that had come out. Yes, this is true. Did you want to touch on some of them before we move forward then? Oh, there was, there was just a couple. I liked the uh, Beemotes, one of the Blizzard ones. Did you? Did you? Keep going. You, you did. That's right. You didn't actually you know, look at any of the April Fool's. Day so yes. Yeah, so I guess. <laughs> sorry. I guess my <laughs> disclaimer here is I absolutely hate April Fool's Day, and I will never joke with you guys or play with your hearts because that is what April Fool's Day is. People just think it's cool to post stupid, crazy stuff on the internet, even though that's kind of basically every day on the internet. But any case, um, I'm not a fan of it, so I ignore all that stuff. So Nineball is like super excited about it. I'm just like, whatever, man. But if you, if you just kind of write April Fools off, you miss some of the greatest things. You miss some of the. I'm telling you, like one of the best jokes that I heard was on Reddit today for April Fools, and it was just it's like, this is a message to all of my gay friends: making April Fools' Day jokes about male pregnancies is not off the table. Nothing. Yep. Nothing. Any other April no. Fool's jokes you want to talk about? <laughs> uh, I, I hate it! Uh-huh. Big head mode? Big, yes. big head mode? I did see it. Actually, that's kind of funny. That's kind of funny. Yeah, that one That one, That one. one was cute. And then um, the Diablo fans, April Fool's Day joke. What did they do? Self, selfies coming to Diablo. Oh, God. They, they used one of the model editors, and they went in there taking selfies with the Crusader. 
Terrible. Just terrible. With a crusader uh, of all classes, too? My goodness. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed? Hey, Thunder. Thunderclaw, that was actually the first one and only one that we actually covered if, uh, <laughs> if Leviathan had his way. Mm -hmm. Like to jump to topic so quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to real news. Yesterday, uh, when the internet wasn't broken, uh, there was a blog post that went up talking about what to expect when season three drops. We know now, and as of, I believe, last week or so, that season three will be coming April 10th, season two ending April 5th, and the patch dropping on April 7th. So those are your landmark dates to keep in mind. And that's actually uh, this coming weekend. So yeah. you know, prepare for Easter and the end of season two. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, it really is. So, you know, it's like if you have any last minute goals that you need to achieve, you better get started on it soon. Because, yeah, it kind of kind of crept up on uh, even though I knew it was April 5th, it still crept up on me because it's like, oh, uh, it's it's March 26th. I'm fine. Right. I'm perfectly fine. Oh, crap. <laughs> and now here it is. Now here it is. And this is actually a moment. Um, the only other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of this is just that there is a post here on Diablo.BlizzPro.com if you guys want to go and read up what the uh, blog... The blog basically just talks about some of the seasonal items that will be coming, um, some of the legendary gems to expect. Um, and so, you know, the, you, those are things you can read up on to prepare for Season 3. Um, for the most part, though, there is nothing else you can really do since everything will be cleared out. So just kind of, I don't know, either take a break in between or work on that non-seasonal stash minigame, <laughs> which is yep. always fun. But one of the things I did realize is that in our excitement, we totally skipped over weekend gaming. So I guess we can tie that into this hype of Season 3. Yeah, because that's, that's kind of what this last week in gaming has been, is just trying to rush through and get some of those those last minute things done for the season. Yeah, so you're working on what, the lore thing at this point? Yeah, I'm working on the lore one. I'm almost done with all of the... Uh, right now, I just kind of... I played through the game and got as many of the uh, the books along the way as I could in addition to just all of the like journal entries and things of that nature. I'm almost done. I think I have about five more books to do in Act 1 and then moving on to Act 2. But from what I hear, Act 5 is the absolute worst. That's where everyone got caught up mm. with those uh, ancient... getting the books off of those ancient remains i think uh what was it lala you know uh, one of the listeners on the show and she was on uh she was actually on the show uh back during the uh the season two launch That's as right. one of our special guests she uh, streamed with us all night uh it took her something like 22 hours just to get that last book it was ridiculous farming yeah. straight for just not like 22 hours in total or something along those lines it's like 22 hours farming that one book in act five and the uh the ruins of corvus just absolutely ridiculous yeah some of them i mean it's total rng uh whether some of them appear or not so you know it's the kind of grind where yeah it's easy because you're in normal and you're just running through content but you're flip it's back to the days of flipping games like you remember when legendary um materials were a thing in the game so people were mm -hmm. flipping you know to go and kill certain purple mobs and stuff yeah and checking on bounties to see if the bounty was the purple mob etc so it's almost a harken back to those days yeah i, I remember doing that for i think it was uh Tao on the uh um unique morlu in act four and the gardens of hope too mm -hmm. it was like the reverberating demon bone i think it was for making one of the quivers is what oh, i was hunting right. for yeah because it was it was a really nice quiver with guaranteed crit chance the early days man oh yeah man Things some good crazy. old days <laughs> any other goals that you want to hit before the season ends in like what uh, four or five days <laughs> yeah honestly that's the only one that i really care about at this point um uh you know actually thanks to thanks to you helping me out i did get uh lionhearted not within the top 1000 but i still got the conquest itself completed there you um go. yeah because that, that was pretty much the rest of my last week was actually you know played a lot uh played a lot of games with you and you know like uh three days uh lieutenant lunatic and just some other guys from the clan you know, going through and knocking out some greater rifts, leveling up gyms, just having a, a good old time over in Raid Call. Yeah, man, it's been a lot of fun just to hop into some group stuff. That's actually going to be a major focus for me going into Season 3. I'm trying to keep it fresh in terms of, you know, who, how I treat each season. And Season mm -hmm. 3 to me kind of seems like a great opportunity to just blow the doors off of everything that was normal previously. So, you know, trying to stream a lot more, trying to play with people a lot more, just because everything's going to be so fresh and new. 
you know, there, there are no real secrets out there because no one knows anything really. Mm -hmm. So there's no real need to kind of like keep things behind the veil or, you know, adhere to this like ridiculous secrecy that I have for some weird, weird reason with my Crusader, especially <laughs> since I'll be playing Barb and I haven't yep. played Barb in forever. Um, I'm really excited to kind of share it with the community and have them kind of like teach me how to play this class again. <laughs> yeah, so now you'll be looking what your mentality was in the previous seasons of keeping the secrets to yourself is now going to be reversed because you're going to be actively going out to find other people's secrets to, in order to play your new your new class. That's right. Yep. Give me all Let's your secrets, it's... internet. And, and so it has come full circle. <laughs> hey, you know, I got to balance it out, yin and yang. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of ending out season two, uh, I did finally reclaim an ancient blade of prophecy yesterday night it was actually woo, it was one of the very last uh grid of rifts that i did before going to bed and for whatever reason i remember i was talking to you i was like i think greater rifts is just going to be the way to do it because you know i'm guaranteeing a few legendary items every time and because i'm high up in the greater rifts at that point they should have a better chance to roll ancient so who knows but funny enough we were talking about it earlier it actually came from Kadala. So I have no yep. issues with this woman ever again. Yeah. Thank you, Kadala. I don't know. I still have the bad taste of Tasker and Theo in my mouth. <laughs> Will you ever yeah. get over it? No. You'll never get over it. I really won't. It. <laughs> it was like just like one of those ones, you know, could just could never find them in season one. It was one of the first legendaries I gambled in season two. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. And it wasn't even, I didn't, you know, it's like, I didn't even want to play a Pet Witch Doctor. And here I am, I'm still playing a Pet Witch Doctor. <laughs> Dude, you were I just, still... it's actually, this is also something that you guys talked about in the very first episode, because Archon was showing off his Lightning Wizard. And one of the reasons why it was that build was it was the items he found. And you okay. guys were both saying, you know, it's it's kind of the stat, the state of the game right now, because we can't really farm super efficiently and we can't exactly, you know, plan out builds. You just got to roll with what you get. So I think you literally just got a, a dose of that for six weeks. Yeah, yeah, that I definitely did. And that kind of goes back, you know, we, we might, throughout the episode, we might go back to the Tavern Talk because I realized we didn't talk a lot about Tavern Talk during uh, last week's episode because we got a lovely story um, <laughs> of a demon hunter. Um during last week's episode that ate up a lot of time but uh yeah those in t the tavern talk that was actually one of the questions that they had gotten you know it's like the player i think it's the player's question was something along the lines of you know it feels really bad when i can't get this one item that i want in order to do this build but i find these other things to do a build that i didn't want to play and the devs were like oh that's awesome that's good you know, that's good that's the intent you know is that we want we want some of these like really powerful items that you can build a build around build a build um and that when it drops that you go and do it you know that you that it might get you excited that it might not be what you plan for but hey look this is something that's cool it's something that's powerful um and with all the balance up there that they've been doing it's something that's viable and can actually take you to that next level you know jumping into torment six at the beginning of a season or you know pushing your greater rift to the next level yeah and i think that's why it's really when we're looking at diablo outside of the microcosm of like the present day we're looking at D3 in terms of the development and in terms of what we can expect, what we know. So almost like a future uh, forecast, basically. We know we're going to be getting new items with every season because the devs have, you know, kind of um, given themselves that task. And what yep. that means is the item pool will continue to get larger with more potential for items and builds and things. And I think one of the, to you know, kind of tie it back into the Tavern Talk, one of the things that John Yang was talking about specific to Barbarians was that the IK set is a bland set, in quotes, you know? It, it doesn't necessarily survive its uh, on any one particular skill. Obviously, it props up Call of the Ancients and Wrath of the Berserker, but mm -hmm. that still allows you to use basically any spender. Um, it allows you, if you finagle some things with your Ring of World Grandeur or um, other items in the set, to use any weapon that you want instead of the, the Boulder Breaker, etc. So you can really get a sense of this set is going to evolve as they add more items to the game. And mm -hmm. that, it kind of harkens back to what you were just talking about, how it lends itself to those moments of discovery where, yeah, I want a furnace or, yeah, I want an ancient boulder breaker. But I just found a, um, what's that item? Oh, Ashbringer. 
you know, a mm -hmm. corrupted ash burner. And hey, I want to try this out. Oh, I just found a Maximus. I haven't used that in a long time. Maybe I'll make a fire build. And so I think it kind of ties into also the idea that, you know, people want to break Kadala out. They want to make it so that uh, the weapons can be chosen based on, you know, a sword, an axe, etc. And you actually had a great counterpoint to this, which I would love if you bring that up. But I think it does go against that idea that the devs have um, kind of given as a stock answer to that question. Uh, if we want you to discover other items and weapons along the way that you might use instead, maybe you have your endpoint of, you know, I need a Blade of Prophecy, I need a Furnace, etc. But maybe you'll have this interesting um, thing along the way as they add these more exciting weapons and options. Mm hmm yeah, and you know, so you going through mentioning that that obviously makes me think of um, the Akan set for the Crusader. Why it's so powerful is because it's a, it's a generalist set, you know. And whereas a lot of classes are kind of getting a generalist set, um, you know, Zumasa's is very general, uh, Natalia's is very general, but then the Crusader, you're you're getting uh, Roland's, which is a very you know specialized set. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of going through and having ones that they'll have sets built around like a specific skill or set of skills and then other ones where it'll be you know it's like make this work right and i think that's good you need a bit of both because then you know as the fantasies get played up as we get more sets um which is something cool that they mentioned too that for season or i guess they didn't tie it to a season but for patch 2.3 they did confirm that the uh, sets, uh, the classes that didn't get love this term, this wow, I can't talk. The <laughs> classes that didn't get new sets this time around, so the Crusader, the Witch Doctor, and the Monk, I think that's right, uh, will all yes. be receiving brand new sets in 2.3, not just you know reworks or anything like that. So that's something to awesomely look forward to. But yeah, I think yeah, like you were just saying, we need those options in terms of this is a specific set that's going to prop up shield bash or sweep attacks, stuff that people weren't really thinking about prior to this set being awesome. Multi shot, you know, on the other side, etc. Yep. But then of course those general sets will again lend themselves to that. Hey, I want to try this out, and I'll just build it around a cons because a con let me lets me do kind of anything. Yep. I will still wait for the day when they finally um, go back on their word and actually make a set that gives uh, Vengeance 100% uptime. <laughs> Someday, you will get that vindication. Yep, I, I'll wait for it. Might be three years from now, but I will wait for it. You know what you could do, though? Just use an Obsidian Ring of the Zodiac. Yeah, massive cooldown reduction in an Obsidian Ring of the Zodiac. Though that that's still... I don't know. I'd have to check that out. See see how well that works together. Because how long is the duration of... Now we're just like theorycraft. Let's go off the deep end. So how yeah. long is the duration of Vengeance? 15 seconds. And it's a... a... Two minute. Oof. Yeah, that's a lot to make up for. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me double check those numbers. But yeah. But you would... It you... is. It is? Those it, are right. Those are right. Because I was just going to, as you check it, I was just going to say, the thing is, when you're in Vengeance, you're getting crazy uh, resource generation. And so you should be able to spend quite a bit, which is going to sync up very nicely with that Obsidian Ring. Yep. Oh, sorry. It is uh, 15 seconds and 90 second cooldown. Nice. I was right on one, almost right on another. <laughs> so it's basically up for one quarter. Mm -hmm. So you would have to find a way to kill the other 75%. Hmm, I don't know. Yeah. Could yeah. be a thing. Could be. Could be. <laughs> I guess it would be what the proc coefficient on all of the additional attacks, because you're do you're pumping out a lot of attacks while that's up. Yeah. And then of course the other question is is, you know, will it matter? <laughs> <laughs> will it be good enough? But I mean, it's a thing. It, it doesn't even matter if it's good or not, because it's just the thing you want. As long as you can make your reality come true, then technically yeah. the game is doing its job. Yep. Which is actually another one of those ones I'm just so excited about the new Natalia set is one strafe becomes viable in the mainstay of the build. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And then the second one is a lot of the, the up, uh, the big builds are using vengeance seethe as a hatred generator. So it gives you that 15 seconds of, uh, just obscene hatred generation and obscene damage that you're going to be putting out. So I love, two of my favorite skills from the demon hunter that never get any use together in one build. Could it get any better? So what you're telling me is that the DH is going to become a burst oriented class. They've never been that way before. Never been that way before. <laughs> never burst and <laughs> demon hunters unheard of crazy. No, that sounds awesome, man. And so that, and you have confirmed, right? That's the class you'll be playing in season three. 
yes, I will be playing a Demon Hunter yet again. There it is, guys. Mm -hmm. Stuff to look forward to. And so we did have one more news item, too, before we go too crazy with all sorts of randomness. Uh, mm -hmm. You noted that there is Reaper of Souls for 50% off on the Xbox One. Yep, this is one that we didn't cover uh, last week because uh, uh, Blizzard actually had Reaper of Souls in Diablo 3 through the Blizzard store 50% off. But it was kind of in between episodes, so we weren't able to cover it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, going through, I just wanted to check. I wanted to check and see if that sale was still going on um, when I was doing some research this morning. And I found that um, it is actually part of the, uh, the, they call it the gold sale or sale on gold. Uh, over on Xbox Live. So if you have an Xbox One, Reaper of Souls is 50% off right now if you buy it through the marketplace. And a lot of people have been loving the console version. So if you are a PC player, um, maybe you know this next week between seasons, you go out and buy uh, Reaper of Souls on your Xbox One and try that out before hopping mm -hmm. back on the PC or something just to mix it up. Yeah, there's a there's a one follower of the show um, on Twitter, Kiri, that she loves going on about the console version. She she also has it for the Xbox, and she it's like one of her favorite ways to play the game. She kind of goes back and forth between the PC and the console, but her heart is kind of now set on the console version. It's it's really cool how it actually has won over like a decent pop part of the population that actually just started playing it on PC originally. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you want, actually, I don't know if. I don't know for certain on the Xbox, but I know for sure on the PS4, there is that share button. So the closest thing you can get to a selfie cam is zooming in on your uh, PlayStation 4 and hitting that share button. And then that goes directly to Twitter. So, hey, you know, April Fool's aside, you might get your selfie game on on the console. There you go. Boom. Tying it in. Tying it in. I like it. Uh, just I'll give you one little celebration there of April Fool's. <laughs> just one. Just one. <laughs> Everybody gets one. That's right. Yep. Spider-Man. Family Guy. See, I, got, culture reference. I got nothing for you there. Okay. All right. <laughs> Just more things to research at some point. Ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. Ever so slightly. And now that we're... Are we ready for feedback? We're ready for feedback, right? I think we are. Unless there's anything else that you want to talk about. Any goals that you might have for Season 3? Oh, goals for Season 3. Um... Oh, actually, one of the things that I can bring this back up, one of the things that they did point out in the write-up for the upcoming season and what to expect is the conquests, the mm -hmm. conquests that will be coming up. And uh, some new ones here are Years of War, which is Reach Greater, or actually, that's not a new one, but it's uh, the updated version of the one. Oops, there's a timer on this thing. It's the updated version of the, you know, Get to Greater Rift 35, etc. Except this one is Get to Greater Rift 40 solo, with the bonuses of three of the following class sets. And I think we talked mm -hmm. about that a little bit in one of the previous shows. But, you know, it's yeah. like your IK set. Your It's none of the new sets, unless they've changed it since we last looked at it. But um, it's like your IK set, your Earth and Might, your whatever have you. Yeah, and that that's one of those ones where it's like, since it wasn't including any of the new sets, and, you know, uh, forgive me if... Uh, not sure i don't believe that that's been updated but it has been uh it's been like a week or so since i've last been on the ptr maybe we can get confirmation in chat while we're talking about it uh once they catch up with us here but it was on some classes you have like you know the witch doctor one of them is the Helltooth set and then for the demon hunter one of them is the shadow's mantle it's gonna so be it's, tough <laughs> yeah that one is going to be pretty tough in order to go through and do that solo on one class on uh, if you want to do it just on, as a single class for greater rift 40 you know it's like if you go through and do it with shadow's mantle yeah you're not going to die at greater rift 40 even with the the demon hunter being a glass cannon with how tanky that set is but hmm. you might not really be killing anything <laughs> hey man just, that's why it's a conquest that's why it's a challenge that's... This is true. This is true. But yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, one thing you do have to consider, though, is there will be reasonable power creep. Um, so with the new legendary gems and with, uh, or not even with the new, but just the fact you'll be able to get them up in level, um, and then you'll be able to have an ancient weapon, maybe it'll prop up your damage a bit. Yeah, maybe. Just and then uh, Dainty in chat is going through and saying, Bob, make it work. I will point out that you, Dainty, you did say on a previous episode that you were going to go and do 
that achievement or that conquest wearing Shadow's Mantle, Helltooth, and Invokers. Oh, that's so, right. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be looking forward to watching your progress over the course of the season <laughs> on how that goes for you. So speaking about make it work. Called out. Let us, let us know. But yeah, the one that I did want to point to here is On a Good Day, which I think is going to be a really fun one. You need to level six legendary gems to level 40. So it's basically mm -hmm. just going to be a sprint to get up to Greater Rift, you know, 39, 38 or so if you want to work on those um, 60 and 30% chances to get it up to that 40. But yeah, I can just imagine this, especially for hardcore, like people sprinting in the first couple of days to get up in high greater rifts and partying up and stuff. And things are going to happen, man. It's going to be bad. And then when you die, you take those gems with you that you're trying to level up. So yeah. now you have to restart all over. I like this one just because it kind of adds a bit of that race functionality to it. You know, we had the get to 70 first, and obviously that was difficult uh, to kind of be legit for obvious reasons. Hashtag exploits. Hashtag exploits. But this one just seems like a really fun... I'm curious to see how it uh, pans out and how quickly it fills up. Mm -hmm. And then the curses one. Uh, so these are the two ones that weren't yet revealed. Curses is uh, kill 300 or more monsters in a cursed chest event at level 70 on Torment 6. And I actually was looking at this one because I think... It's going to be doable from... I was using a Condemned Crusader in the Halls of Agony, I want to say 3, and there's that Cursed Chest yes. uh, down there. That has always been my highest record, is the one in the the Halls of Agony, and then the second is the uh, Cursed Chapel um, in Act 4. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. There's And there is, I guess there's the one with the spiders, too, in um, uh, the Spider Queen, the area before... Orina or whatever her name is. Yeah, um, that one I've always had issues with, just because the spawn is so spread out that you can't like localize your damage like you could for um, the ones in Act One and Act Four. That's a good point. And sometimes they run away pretty far too. I, I say the ones in Act One. That is an Act One. <laughs> the one in Halls of Agony Three with the zombies. Yes. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see where people go for this and what builds they use and stuff. Because the using Condemn with the Vacuum Rune on this was awesome. You just stand in the middle and everything just goes zoop, 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 zoop. Yep. What was your personal record? I wish I paid attention to those things. Actually, I wish that there was a way to check it. Because I'm not totally sure, but I want to say it's like high 200s, like 286 or so. So. Oh, that, yeah, that is much better than mine. Uh, the highest that I got on my Demon Hunter, I don't remember the exact number. I just remember I was just shy of 250. So it was like 247, 248, somewhere thereabouts. Mm, yeah, that one definitely seems doable and fun because you, you don't have to be solo for that one. You can do it in a group. Oh, true. Yep, that's right. Yep. So with our powers combined... <laughs> Do you, Captain... you get that one? Yes, Captain Planet. Okay. Yeah. Right. Just, I have to check sometimes. I did it. <laughs> uh, yay. Yeah. But uh, what was I going to say about that? I also like it because it's going to be very quick to attempt. And sometimes, you know, the, the barrier to entry on some of them is just that it takes a while to kind of get after them. And then you might say, eh, I'm going to give up because it's too much time to commit. Um, but I think the ones that they have been kind of keying in on, so like Avaricia, which is coming back, um the speed racer is also coming back which is sweet but obviously that one is a bit more of a commitment because it's an hour yes um, yes we're we're doing it this time we are going to do it this we time. we are going to do it hashtag motivated we are <laughs> going to get this one done hashtag so many hashtags um yeah man so, so i'm just glad that they're they're kind of targeting ones that you either will have to play a little differently to accomplish um or that you will kind of accomplish as you progress through a season and if you want to prioritize it, then, you know, you're going to take some extra measures to get it done. But yeah, those are those are the goals that I always kind of look at first, the conquests, and see how I'm going to start my season off tackling those. Yeah, I guess uh, it kind of, you know, the, the hand that you're dealt with, uh, what items that you get in the beginning will kind of gauge your uh, your interest in which ones you're going to be going after first. That's true, and too. I, yeah. Nice little tie-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we keep keep looping it together. <laughs> it's like we know what we're doing here or something. No, we don't know. What I we're wouldn't doing. go. No, I wouldn't go that yeah, far. No, no. <laughs> uh -huh. It just it just happens to work out that way. Is all that it is. Indeed. And uh, I don't believe did I ask you what you what goals you have? What are you looking forward to or planning to get done? 
Well, I guess that kind of uh, falls into like how long we expect the season to be, whether it's going to be like a three month season or a four month season. Mm-hmm. Because obviously, I was not able to accomplish my goal of getting uh, to of uh, pushing it to Paragon 400 for this season, but hopefully we'll be able to do that next season on the Demon Hunter. And then also, just the other big thing for me was Speed Racer coming back. Need to get Speed Racer. Yes, it's just it's like that's just like a, a personal, just like a personal vendetta. Now I have to get that conquest. I'm absolutely with you, man. And it, it's not uh, the nice thing is that we have our notes from last time. We have our past attempts to look at too, mm-hmm. and you know we'll just we'll just have to give it a go again. See, and what's actually what'll be really cool too is to see if any of the new items kind of help to play into it or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You know. What would that be? Because for some of them, I mean, that uh, the Cursed Ring of the Zodiac, or the Obsidian Ring of the Zodiac, that would that could potentially help if you have some passive damage that you could be doing as you're running through. But you'd have to be spending and hitting things, too. Yeah. So, we'll see, though, man. Lots of exciting things to look forward to. Season 3 is going to be insane. And I can really feel the hype from the community. Just uh, one of the things I tweeted out earlier on the Westmarch Workshop account was just kind of uh, what people were planning to play or you know how what what stuff they're looking forward to in season three and what they're getting done in season two and it was just so many replies from people just being like oh i don't know what class to roll like i i have so many conflicts and i just don't know there's so much excitement and blah 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 and i think that's amazing that for the first maybe not the first time but for the first time in a long time people are just at a crossroads of i don't know what to do because everything looks so awesome mm-hmm. it's a lot of the sentiments that we saw back when season one was going or when season one was about to start, all that uh, that anticipation uh, coming up with the new season, new changes, like uh, big sweeping changes, even though they're not adding in any new game mechanics, like greater rifts. Like this seems to be like one of the this seems to like rival season one in terms of what it's offering in terms of content. Yeah, well, when you think about it, you know, the, there are two sides to the Diablo equation. There's the stuff you can do and the stuff you can get. And season one was the stuff you can do. Season three is the stuff you can get. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And with that, I think we are good to push on over to the feedback section. And I <laughs> I asked you about it originally because I remember we said we would do honorable mentions from the contest. And then we also got super excited. We were just really excited <laughs> about everything. Yeah. <laughs> so well. we kind of forgot to do that. Um, one of the honorable mentions that I wanted to bring up was from... <laughs> this is, there's like no good way to like talk about this one but it was from scott adams and he gave us one of his diablo memories but his intro to that memory was probably the best intro because it was the binary code for sup fellas yep getting creative i like it yeah man we're seeing we're seeing some interesting uh uses of language in our greetings and whatnot in our feedback so keep it coming people i love it yep and if you would like to contribute feedback in the future send an email on over to westmarchworkshop at blizzpro.com and you can also submit stuff via twitter too if you feel like it and that's going to be the wm workshop and if you want to take the first one mr Nineball, you can go right ahead yeah sure will do uh one of the ones that uh actually you know speaking of scott you know he actually sent in um another email in which that one he uh said uh uh, i'm gonna butcher this one uh video melion which is uh elvish that keeps going through with these different variations of sup fellas in other languages (laughs) uh because he he uh previously sent in um the klingon one oh that's right yeah yeah so yeah, I'll be looking forward to see what he comes up with next. Um, but yeah, uh, he he wanted to know like uh, what did we think about the shortening of set bonuses, like making six pieces four piece uh, six piece set bonuses on like the four piece or two pieces, and it's making it easier or that you need less sets or that you can mix uh, mix yeah. I can talk <laughs> mix and match sets together. You know, is this is this something that they're planning? Is it something that they're working towards? You know, it's like, is it is it yeah? You know, like what what's going on with here? For him, it just seems like a really odd change. You know, I believe one of the design philosophies behind that was they, even though they want you know you to equip the whole set, they're looking for ways of making the set work before you get the six piece one of the big ones is of course marauders you know with that one the set was okay 
um, when you had five pieces. But then when you had six pieces, you know, it's like upgrading from a tricycle to a Ferrari, you know, the, the level of difference that you had, it was just such a huge ramp up in your overall power and ability with just that last piece. They went and spread it out. So that way they made it the four piece set bonus gives you that, you know, kind of that feeling of the set. So now my turrets will use my abilities when I cast them. And then the six piece is what makes it powerful. So it kind of, it gives you that flavor. It gives you, this is how the set's going to work. This is your play style. And then the final one is just to come in and, you know, now you're good. You're good to go. This is where like a lot of the power comes from. And that's what a lot of the changing of the, uh, the, the sets uh, around has been. It's they just kind of want to break that power up across you know the uh, the set bonuses so that way you know you don't keep five pieces of your set in the stash until you get the six piece they want you you when you find a set piece it's supposed to be exciting you're supposed to go and use it and you know that's just kind of what some of these changes have been in line for yeah and i also i was thinking about this one at work and one of the things i was kind of rolling around in my head i was like could this lead to the death in quotes of the ring of royal grander Um, It's the kind of thing where Wyatt kind of posted a a tweet on this or touching on this too. It's the kind of thing where it encourages people to not only wear the set earlier, like you're saying, because, you know, now those powers are being shifted further down. So you're going to get more power as you start to equip more pieces. But also it it can allow you to just say the six pieces is pretty good. That, That power looks sick. But if I just stick to four pieces... I can actually wear, you know, another set and get that two piece bonus. And because the bonuses in general are just going to be better, maybe the mixing and matching ends up being more powerful than the six piece that you could have gotten on, you know, the end of just wearing one set. And I realized as I say this, that it actually could, (laughs) it could either kill the ring of Rogue grander in terms of like, you just want to wear that set and you're, you're going to mix and match other things, or it could actually bolster the power of the ring of Rogue grander if you want to wear multiple sets. Because yep. it, it'll allow you to, you know, you take your, again, go back to the barb because that's like my research mode right now. You take your IK uh, boulder breaker, you take the belt, and those are pieces that aren't really in any other set. So now you have a little bit of leeway with the ones that are usually seen with the shoulders, the helm, the uh, chest, gloves, boots, pants, etc. You can mix and match. And then when you're wearing your Ring of Royal Grander, now maybe you're taking a four piece here, a four piece there, etc. Um, or maybe four piece, six piece. There's so many new and interesting combinations. So I think it's it's just adding to the amount of stuff that you can do and come up with. And it's going to mean more builds, which means more excitement for you as a player. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more options is always better. I guess the point of that is uh, balancing it and actually giving the six piece set bonuses you know, a reason to be claimed. You know, there'll still be a lot of power in those because they, obviously, they have to give you a reason of why you want to equip a single six piece of a set instead of using like two four pieces with a ring of royal grandeur. Right. Yeah, that'll be the uh, the fun part for the devs on their side mm-hmm. to make sure that those six pieces are still enticing, so that yep. you want to wear that single set. Uh, he did also just have one other question. He wanted to know if this is a bug or not. But he's been noticing that if he say say he goes into a rift or a greater rift in Act One, um, and that he'll like get a checkpoint, go into the rift, he'll exit the rift, but then he ends up in Act Two or Act Five. And uh, basically, what that does is, I, I'm not sure if it's a bug or just something that they haven't gotten around to it. But the mechanic that's going on is when you um, is when you use the uh, stone at the end of the rift, you know, or you know, just uh, teleporting off of um, Urshi, it puts you back to like your default location, and the default location for the rifts is the act that you kind of join the game on, which normally is tied to whatever is one of the uh, the bonus acts. This is something that I notice a lot because I always go to Act Two in order to go and do my greater rifts, um, and that after you complete it you know, I'll get spit back out in, like, Act 3. And, you know, so it's always constantly the thing. It's like, I don't want to be in Act 3. I want to be in Act 2. Act <laughs> yep. 2 is best act. Ooh, I don't know if I would go with you there. I think A1 reclaimed that that uh, with the move of the jeweler up to the top. I, 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 will, I will concede that, except Act 2 is best act. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so... 
But uh, that is my defense, <laughs> um, and I rest my case. Wow, you all, you should be a lawyer right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're right in terms of the answering of the question. I don't know about the act thing. We can hash that out later. Hashtag that out later. Um, but though also it occurs in uh, the trials as well too. So when you finish the trial, if you don't TP out and you yeah. just take the TP that it makes for you, that also brings you back to that original act that you're talking about. Yeah, because it's like you know, if you're in a if you're in a dungeon or something like that, it has a predetermined point that it summons you back in front of the uh, the dungeon. And I guess just the way that the coding is is that that predetermined point for the rifts, since they're not tied to a physical spot on the map, is just whatever that default login location was for your game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe I don't know. Could is it a bug? Is it? A, it's not a. I don't know if that's a feature. <laughs> But uh -huh. yeah, we'll see if that gets changed, I suppose. Yep. That, and, that, that is my thoughts on what is happening in the background, whether it's intended or not. Who knows? Who knows? And speaking about rifts, let's talk about greater rifts. We had a huge email from Alienationer that I ended up uh, kind of slimming down into some major points. And so basically the problem that he identifies is that there seems to be complaints regarding the linear difficulty in greater rifts, where it's simply as you go up, more HP and more damage. He highlights some of the community solutions that have been thrown out there so far, which are you know, giving the mobs more attacks or fixes, perhaps uh, having more challenging environments, so traps or things like that, stuff in the actual rift that you're in that can kill you or hurt you, and then mechanics changes. Um, so that would be more of you know looking at... Oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, well, I'm sure I'll find it later. But yeah, mechanics changes. <laughs> um, that train has left the station. It has. I hope to I hope to jump back on it soon. Um, he notes that this is something that actually you can observe in campaign mode. So basically, as you start out in Act 1, you know, all the monsters are slow and they're not very challenging. And it gets more difficult as you go through the acts until you get to Act 5, where you have the hardest mobs that have extra abilities. Um, they're faster, etc. He also notes that the environments do this progression as well. They go from being, you know, pretty easy traps to dodge, um, chandeliers, etc. in Act 1. Then you go to Act 3 and you have like the flame breathing things. And then you go to Act 5 and you have those blood pools, etc. So there's a progression there as well. What Alienationer points out is that Blizzard can really only add RNG to Greater Rifts because they would have to rebuild the game as a whole to kind of make changes uh, beyond that. And what he's talking about is because there's infinite scaling, RNG is kind of needed there by design. Um, as the things, as the rifts were, were to get harder, the only real way to do it without like spending a lot of anchor time and a lot of dev time, etc., would just be you know make it RNG and it's and mm. just scale the HP and the damage. Um, he also uses the journey from one through seventy in terms of crafting as an example of kind of that control over the progression because you only get certain items tied to certain levels and as you level up the restrictions drop uh, less and less until you can find everything at 70 and again at 70 it's all rng because every item is available to you so the only way that they can kind of create that uh level of hey you might find your furnace today you could find it later on is uh through rng and he mm -hmm. just uh, he, he kind of closes out by saying i know people love to bash blizzard and the dev team but what that team and uh, those people have done so far has been extremely creative and they're bound by these walls of progression limitations that he outlined above. So he kind of feels their pain. Now, my thought on this was um, there was a Mario game and I can't remember what the name of it was. I know you love Mario Nineball, so you should really vibe with this example. Mario Golf 4? <laughs> it wasn't quite that. It was back on the NES, but you could play Mario Party 17. Yes, that's the one. You could play it co-op, um, and what would occur was you had to cl you had to kill all the enemies on the screen, and you would do it by like hitting platforms underneath them as they would uh, like land on the ground. And some of them were just walking on the ground, so they were very easy to kill. Some of them were kind of jumping, so they had different monsters of different difficulty. And I believe the levels one through ten were pretty simple, and it was a like going from level 10 to level 11 all of a sudden the difficulty would increase like the mobs would um get a little bit harder have different tactics to them um the platforms might have like ice on them so it's harder to control your character etc and so i'm thinking like why not apply this to greater rifts so maybe you have some control back in the scaling of the progression of greater rifts where you know greater rift 1 through 15 
is going to mostly comprise itself of those act one mobs really easy some of those environments that are maybe easier to navigate as well because there are an in there there are a limited pool of maps so the dev team could actually just look at the maps that spawn for greater rifts and say these are easy maps these are our middle medium maps these are hard maps and then you know scale it by a factor of five so one through 15 is going to be kind of that easier stuff the act one stuff uh you know 16 through 30 is then going to be some of the act two ish monsters etc the harder stuff and and on so on and so forth and then when you get up to you know greater rift 60 or 75 or whatever they consider the ceiling to be so that's how you shift it um that's that's the hardest stuff just primarily act five mobs and really tough environments and traps and things like that mm -hmm. i think i figured out which one that was is mario teaches typing <laughs> I love you so much. Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> but I mean, it is an it is an interesting question, just in terms of greater rifts, because yeah, it's not that fun to just see you know the mobs become bigger meat bags in terms of stuff you have to hit longer to have them die. And I remember at one point, um, it might have been two tavern talks ago, the devs were talking about how they weren't quite satisfied with. Um, the health of some of the greater rift guardians at the higher uh, greater rifts just because mm -hmm. you see all the tactics of them and then you're basically just repeating that same sequence over and over and so they thought those fights could be shorter um but just have you know the the tactical moments of them kind of feel awesome for a limited amount of time rather than just this prolonged fight like, okay i'm dodging this again okay I do this again yeah yeah and then of course also we we've got a new rift guardian Yes, Hamelin. Yeah. So it'll be it'll be so just some new funny things like throw in there and change up the meta. Yeah. And maybe that's another way too that it'll um progress as well too. They can always add more Rift Guardians. They might add more monsters because we I would assume once we get uh what is it called? Ruins of Seshron, um, those monsters will then mix into the pool and stuff. So I mean, obviously, we probably won't see a lot of that until an expansion, maybe, knock on keyboard. But, um, you know, that's something to at least also leverage as well, is that maybe the monster pool will grow. Maybe the Great Rift Guardian pool will grow. And add, and they are adding more maps. They're changing the design of the maps and stuff. So we'll just see. We'll see as it progresses. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, um, yeah, like you said, it, it, there's not a lot that they can do without going and handcrafting every single rift above a certain level in order to like kind of detail the difficulty or specific mechanics inside of it. You know, they might be able to implement uh, certain groupings to try and um, you know leverage it a little bit. Something like uh, like imagine a, obviously we've all encountered it, but you know like uh, maps that are like a whole bunch of executioners. Or the uh, um, what was it? The uh, Armageddon's or Armadons from uh, Act Four, the big things that like to stun you. Yeah. Then combined with uh, tons of bees, so you have these things that like to like get up right in your face, stun you a lot, and then bees flying all over the place, just shooting you with range damage. Not fun. Not fun, but uh, it, that that would be just like an interesting way that they could do it, where you can group certain enemies with certain mechanics that work together you know if maybe past a certain point that you start seeing those those kind of like grouped enemies you know more and more often right uh, as a way to add more difficulty and tactics to the fights no i don't disagree with that want to grab another one yeah sure let's go on uh this next one is from uh uh jo gato he just wanted to go through his name is Jo John. I'll call you John because I suck at pronouncing things. I'm sorry, our childs. Um, <laughs> uh, and he he you know just wanted to thank us for doing the, the great podcast. Well, we want to thank you for listening and submitting feedback. It always it always uh it always is a nice little like uh, inspiration when you guys go through and submit questions and feedback for the show. Um, and he just goes through and he wanted to tell his story about uh, like some of his experiences, you know, since uh, since playing launch and everything like that. And just uh, how he's he's loved his condemned crusader and he's had a lot of uh, time. He's gotten up to like Paragon level uh, 675. Um, but his big thing and his question that he wanted to ask us on the show was for season three. He doesn't know what he wants to play and he just so happens that he's trying to decide between a barbarian and demon hunter 
<laughs> well, so, uh, so see, this is where we need Archon as the tiebreaker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because obviously, my opinion is well, I'm playing a demon hunter, so I vote for demon hunter. Awkward. Yep. Because I'm gonna go ahead and say you should play Crusader. Wait, what? Oh, that's the old mm -hmm. tagline. New tagline. You should play the Barbarian. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um or why not both right isn't that always the solution that, that i guess that is always the solution as we we're talking with uh lieutenant lunatic um you know the other night and it's like why play just one like he you know he'll have like every class you know like leveled up in gear and he just goes and plays whatever he wants yeah, man. and hopefully and that's the thing too again you know kind of not trying to beat the dead horse but season length that's really going to be the predictor and the enabler for leveling up and using multiple classes. Obviously, we have things like the Gem of Ease now to ease our way into uh, uh, ults. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Ease our way into ults and things like that. So it's going to help in terms of bringing up another character. But again, you still need time to le to gear that character up properly um, to get familiar with it if you want to push higher, greater rifts, etc. And plus, we will have new sets, so that's going to mean you know a longer time in order to acquire the exact gear that you want if you're trying to run a very specific build etc so yeah time is of the essence and hopefully there will be enough for people that want to run you know a multitude of classes but yeah go yeah. barb <clears throat> demon hunter barb demon hunter <laughs> oh. demon hunter i'm i actually a, right a right rift kicking assassin yeah Ooh. there you go and then you gave it a tagline all right i gotta come with something cool Smash things, Barb. Okay, I'll work on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> write in next week though, and let us know what you pick because by then you'll kind of have to need to decide. Cause... Yeah, you'll you'll have needed to decide by next week. Um, it'll be pretty close on the uh, deadline there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Speaking of things that people like to argue about, maybe nah, not the best segue, but let's talk about stash space because we actually had two people write in independently, but talking about the exact same thing. Uh, and that's stash space for people specifically that level up multiple classes. So it kind of ties in talking about multiple classes. Um, there's just not going to be enough. And I'm looking at an email from Capping Crunch and from Seb. Both of them noted that playing multiple classes just makes stash space a serious problem. Uh, the community solutions that they noted were that maybe you do one to two shared tabs and then four to five non-shared tabs uh, per class. So that could be something, uh, just an entire <laughs> rework of the system is a possible solution, or just straight up more tabs. Um, there's been an increase in the stack sizes. So yeah, we noted that, you know, Ramalani's gift will increase to stack up to 100 now. Um, mm -hmm. They went and pushed up in the last patch, the blue mats, yellow mats, etc. Those stack up to, I believe, like 5,000 now. Um, but it's not enough, according to uh, our friends here who wrote in. Uh, 2.2 is going to be adding more items in sets that will want to hold on to, especially the sets, because as you might develop, you know, this is my Greater Rift set, this is my T6 set, etc. There's going to be needs to stash some of that stuff. Um, so they want to know why Blizzard hasn't really made any additional comments on it since BlizzCon, um, which is just that players will want more whenever we give them more, they'll just want more. And they put the tinfoil hat on and say, well, microtransactions going to have something to do with this maybe because it's a test market over in china and russia or wherever perhaps when they do bring it to the western world uh we'll get those extra stash tabs as things we can buy mm -hmm. maybe potentially possibly maybe eh, it's hard to say anything beyond that right yeah i think i agree that it is a problem in terms of um you there that's the thing you're adding more items to the game which is awesome but you're not also at the same time adding more storage space for them. And we're not getting more character slots or anything like that either. So especially if you're going to be one of those people that also plays hardcore and softcore like a shepherd, that means your potential for mules is going to be lower because you're going to want to maintain your characters and not really delete any of them and have mm -hmm. them for both modes. And then that also means you're playing multiple characters. So then your stash is just going to be taken up with multiple sets, etc. So I do believe that we need more and it is tough to say okay where do you draw the line once you add more yeah. because more is yeah because i mean that that is the the response that we get from the dev team constantly it's like as soon as we increase staff space people will just fill it up with all that extra space and then ask for more yep 
So it's kind of like, at what point do they, they draw the line? What point is, you know, like the, the fair balance? And, you know, what, what point is just, like, excessive? Yeah. And I was actually talking to Dreadscythe, who has an interesting idea for it. But I guess I won't steal his thunder because he might want to talk about it on his own show that he does, which is the uh, Scythe and Shield. It's mm. a little plug there. Um, so, I don't know. They're, huh? Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe we'll see a solution. The thing I think this almost might be similar to like the blood shard cap kind of thing. Like I think enough people will start to say that it's a thing. It needs to be changed, etc. And Blizzard's going to take in all this. You know, give us suggestions. Here's what you know we want to see. What you guys are going to do with uh, making it better. And I think they'll just surprise us with some random thing that actually will hopefully work. Yeah. In my in my heart of hearts. In my hopes of hopes. Yeah, and of course we all we always have that you know that expansion you know talk rumor mill like going on you're like what could it be you know what could we get one of the things that's been consistent is the increase in stash space and I say consistent even though there's only been one expansion but I will have you know that they also increased the stash space between Diablo 2 and Lord of Destruction so there's a precedence there hmm. that is completely unrelated in any way shape or form but I'm going to take it <laughs> and run with it and say that that is why that if they do come out with another expansion that they will increase stash space yet again well they did and I mean you actually have precedent within this generation of game because they did do that with uh, Reaper of Souls if I that they did. so they are, they are tied tied bound you know it is now by law they have to absolutely mm-hmm. written and etched uh, what else you got see next one uh this this was probably um besides going and reading all of the contest submissions this is one of my favorites that i read this week um you know psycho uh, went through and sent us uh, an email from his deployment out in the uh, the desolate sands near Chaldeum. Um, and, you know, he, he just was going through and giving us a, a little update of how things are going over on the other side of the globe um, during his deployment. And, of course, you know, he, he goes through and is adding, like, the little touch of Diablo because I'm stealing his description of the desolate sands <laughs> um, but yeah he just uh, he actually wanted to submit a lore question not so much a lore question but he wanted to re- uh, have a recommendation on uh, books because he's been you know just going through and reading as much so apparently uh, his his uh, reading skill is I can read like a paragon 600 uh, demon hunter going through a normal rift so there you have it. He, it he wants some books to go through and basically just consume and destroy. <laughs> uh, uh, definitely, like the two big ones that I would recommend for just kind of getting a general feel of the game world would be the it's the Diablo anthology, which has all, the three original uh, novels that they published: uh, Legacy of Blood, The Black Road, and Kingdom of Shadow, along with Demon's Bane, which was the very first. Um, Diablo novel published. It was an ebook um, that is not really canon anymore. They've completely changed everything. And it, as you go and you read some of those books, the, some of the references they make to the Sin War and other things, just they don't make sense as much once you read the rest of it. That's why I say go read those first in order to get that feel for it. And then go back and read the Sin War trilogy. Because the Sin War trilogy will tell you, you know, what they state happened in the Sin War now, which is different than what it is in those first books. They kind of changed completely that nature of the Sin War. Um, and, you know, both sides have their merits. I, I kind of like, you know, some of the things, like kind of the shadow, the actual like shadow war that was going on behind the scenes and its interpretation in the earlier novels. But, but definitely um, give both of those, those collections a read. That will, that will set you up good. And then from there, um, I mean, it just gets better. Moon of the Spider, favorite novel um, from the Diablo series. You have to read Kingdom of Shadow before you read it. And then um, The Order and Storm of Light, also two exceptional novels that help really tie in Diablo 3. I dig it. I have a bunch of those books uh, on on my bookcase back there um, that I have yet to read, but they are on my list for the day that I'm not busy playing Diablo. 
I will read about Diablo. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 quick they're quick reads as well. Maybe when I'm uh, at the beaches of Scovos. Mm-hmm. Sorry. You, you tried. <laughs> I tried. You made effort. I did. And I appreciate. I want it to be as cool as Psycho, man. Mm-hmm. Um. All right. Well, there's another email here that is kind of interesting. I, well, I'll I'll announce it before I give opinions on it. So. Uh, Mark J writes in and he says, hi guys, uh, what would you think about Blizzard adding new passive skills that synergize with the effects of a few of the items in the game? The items would still exist, but you could take a passive in place of using the items. So he's looking at basically making the unity and ring of royal grandeur into passives that you could take for balance purposes. Uh, you'd be required to learn them by crafting a new item, well, a new item, a new item, like the hellfire tome of unity or hellfire tome of grandeur. Uh, they would require some new crafting mats granted by salvaging a unity or a ring of royal grandeur. And then he lists um, what those items might be. 250,000 gold as well, 20 forgotten souls, etc, etc. And what do we think about this? I don't know, because I kind of... Like, what does that mean, though? If the If the item still exists as an item, it can't stack, first of all, or else that would be obscene. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it wouldn't make sense for unity anyways, obviously. But... For Ring of War Grandeur, it shouldn't stack, first of all. Second of all, if you turn it into a passive, I feel like it's... It's like where it's basically like turning your passive into another item. Yeah, and it'll also become a passive that 100% of players are going to use once they um, acquire it. And that's, a, that's exactly it. And I remember there was a time when they said specifically that they didn't want things that felt like they needed to be... Uh, equipped in terms of passives and that was why we saw the reluctant but necessary change to one with everything from monks for example we saw a lot of the barb passives that were just like straight up damage passives get changed into kind of more conditional passives that give damage uh, if you're in certain situations etc so they didn't feel mandatory in order to clear content or to survive in content etc and but yeah i think if you do make that you know, if you make the unity or something like that into a passive like who wouldn't take that you know because mm -hmm. if like so don't even think about it as the items just think about it as the effect themselves 50 percent damage reduction is like just insane as i don't think there are any other passives that really give that like there's blur it, for instance for wizards and that's what 17 percent uh 20 20 well still whatever it is it's still much lower than 50 right mm -hmm. <laughs> can agree on that so yeah i i don't know i think it's an interesting idea yep. but yep 17 you're right okay so I think it's an interesting idea, but it's something that would have to, I, I don't, I just don't, I don't see it catching. I, it's a, it's something cool though. Like I, crafting passive sounds like an interesting idea in general. I just don't know how you would make it fit in balance. Yeah. I, I do also kind of like that concept of having like a quest or just like some sort of like massive undertaking that you have to do to like upgrade a skill. It was one of my favorite things in classic WoW was they added in new ranks of skills because but that was back when they actually had you know ranks it was equivalent to uh almost it was like skill points you know back in the d2 days it was just as you leveled up you would get new ranks of your spell so you'd have like a, a warlock shadow bolt you know you'd upgrade it at like level you'd have it at level one and then it would be upgraded at level five and then 15 so on and so forth. And so it would kind of, you do like these power curves where as soon as you got it, it was insanely powerful. But then as you leveled up, it didn't, it's damaged it in scale. So it kept going down and down compared to what the things that you were fighting. And then everything was kind of balanced at once you hit level 60 and in AQ um, 20, they made it so that way skill books could drop. And so you could actually upgrade your skill to one additional level. So it made you feel like really powerful. The concept and like that kind of like that little lore tie in behind it was awesome. It made you feel awesome, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't a 40 man raid. It was only a 20 man raid. So it was a little bit more accessible, um, though a lot of people ended up still having to get theirs, you know, through the auction house. But it was it was just one of those ones where it, it felt cool because you could go through and it's like awesome I got this you know, book my shadow bolt now is one rank higher than like everyone else on the server hmm. 
you know, it was just, it had this really awesome feeling to it. It's like, mine is now better because I was able to go and accomplish something. My skills are now just permanently better. And they, they obviously, they, they changed that around a lot because they got rid of, they got rid of ranks. It just leveled up with you as you went. But that was, that was still one of my favorite memories of uh, Classic WoW. Yeah, it'd be cool to see if something like that could be tied in. And I mean, it's, if you want to look at the blood shark cap again and as an example there's there's potential for something like that because you're tying the achievement of moving up in greater rifts directly to um some sort of reward on the other side so like now your cap is better and that's something that sticks with your character and um it would be tough to kind of balance it out or maybe maybe not even maybe you just go through you can upgrade a gem or you could like upgrade a percent on a passive or something i don't even know yeah, I mean, something like that would be uh, better suited to the talisman system that they showed off, you know, before Diablo 3 launched and they ended up scrapping. That is just like this little tiny, like, sub equipment. And the reason why they got rid of it was because it basically felt like a second inventory set that you had to micromanage. Mm. Um, and But that would be something along those lines where it's you have, like, the talisman and you put all these, like, little pieces of gear that gave you, like, little tiny bonuses and such. And it's just if you accomplish certain things that you could level it up almost like the legendary gems and give you, like, those little tiny minor increases in power as time went on or something that you could go and craft and it just... Uh, there's one thing that Star Trek Online does is that they actually have little bonuses tied to achievements. And say if I go and, you know... Um, if I kill, you know, a thousand, if I'm on my Klingon character and kill a thousand Federation characters, I'll get an achievement for killing a thousand of them, and I'll actually increase my damage against other Federation characters by 2% permanently across the board. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like one of those things, you know, That's it's like, cool. you, yeah, so it's, you know, kill 10,000 wood wraiths. You know, and it gives you a bonus. Oh, now you do 2% more damage to wood wraiths. You know, just the, like maybe little things like that type that, that might be a potential. You know, you go through and you craft this gym, you know, after, you know, killing Uber Diablo a hundred times. And now it increases your fire damage by 1%. Yeah. And I, that, I don't know. And that's even something I remember people... Uh, back in the day when they were looking at achievements and being like, man, achievements are awesome. Some of them take a really long time to finish. But the rewards, like, who does anything with the banner, you know? So someone was saying as a rework, like, yeah, you kill, you do the wood race one, and then maybe it does give you a bonus like that, you know, 1% to kill things in Act 1 or something. I don't know. Something yeah. something more general or whatever. But yeah, yeah. It, could, it could be an interesting way to work rewards in there and also to make that system feel i mean i get but it, i think back in the day the counter argument to that was it would feel make achievements feel mandatory yep Cause, cause and you're... that yeah that is after you were going to make your point i was just going to add the disclaimer that's just like spitballing and throwing ideas and something that another game has done blizzard has been very very adamant about not tying player power in any way shape or form to achievements yeah but not something that I expect in any way, shape, or form. That's just, you know, because they, they, they've made it very clear that they don't want achievements to increase player power in any way. Oh. Fair enough. Um, were there any other feedback items that you wanted to tackle before we bounced huh? on over? I think that covers pretty much uh, all of it. There was there was one more, not so much feedback, uh, but uh, Devin went through and sent us an email uh, earlier in the week congratulating us on what would be our one year anniversary. So you know, thank you for you know going through and uh, you know noticing that, and you know, thank you for your well wishes. Yes, and it was actually uh, funny too because he not only did he point out he was like, "Will you guys do something for your anniversary?" But he also was like, "Maybe you should bring Archons." Like both. Both of our ideas he's he's somehow like bugged our show here yep he knew um but he yeah knew. <laughs> thank you for that one thing that actually uh, kind of wanted to take like an ad hoc question from chat people are talking about Rhymeheart, and one of the things i wanted to talk about i realized but skipped over from the season three preview is the two legendary gems that are coming one in particular is the ice blink and by the way that's a throwback to d2 because that's a unique item that was a chest from a uh, d2 yep. but um, the Ice Blink is, actually, let me see if I can pull that up just so I get it exactly right. It's a gem that's coming, it's exclusive to Season 3, and what it provides is, uh, your cold skills now apply chill effects, and your chill effects now slow enemy, enemy movement by an additional 25%. 
and that's the one that can be upgraded. Um, and then the secondary unlock is gain 10% increased critical hit chance against chilled and frozen enemies. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, yeah, they're definitely trying to make, you know, cold or frozen kind of a build, uh, a, a thing that people can build around. And then you look at something like the Rhymeheart that does damage against frozen enemies, a crap ton of damage against them. And then you look at the other, I think it's a dagger that they're adding to the game. It's like Young Dojin or something like that. I'm probably butchering it. But it makes it so, I believe, uh, after a certain... Ah, oh, shucks. I should have done more research on this. But I know it has it has frozen synergy because I think it's like at, at a certain amount of life missing then it freezes enemies or does more damage to them or something like that. There's syn there's supposed to be synergy there. So I'm just looking at these items in particular and I'm thinking, well, they're definitely trying to push kind of this cold and frozen, frozen, maybe from the movie. Uh, just, just let it go, man. <laughs> there it is. Trying to push that play style. But I'm not just, and I, you know, chat is kind of airing some trepidation against it too. And I'm with them. I just don't see this being a thing that en ends up occurring because pretty much the only classes that dual wield so to use that setup would be monks and barbs and i i don't know that so a it's limited there already and then b i just think there's stronger specs i'm not i think maybe this is something that will get further propped up down the road but right now it just seems i, li I like the idea but i'm not sure about the execution yeah so that was just just something i wanted to harp on obviously I didn't have quite all the info <laughs> in front of me that I thought I would remember. But anyways, we're talking about items. I'm just going to go ahead and roll on over to the items of the week then, where I do know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. let's, let's head on over. Dun, 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 dun. Items of the week. This first one comes from a screenshot of someone's screen, which is cool. Um, or a camera. So meta. <laughs> Gotta love it. And um, I believe this one was submitted by Jeff. I forget, but it was a really old email and I was going to show it on like two shows ago, but you know, for whatever reason, we got backed up on that stuff. Um, but he wanted to know what he should reroll on his Witching Hour. He got an ancient one. It's 595 dex, 614 vit, 5% attack speed increase, and 44% critical hit damage. And the secondaries are 197 fire resistance and 32% extra gold from monsters. Um... I, I can't tell from the screenshot. Oh no, he play. I can tell from the screenshot. He plays a demon hunter. Um, so I mean, I don't really know what else to uh, what else to switch out on that one. Uh, yeah. That's pretty much about the best that you can get it. I guess the only thing would be because you can't get all resist on the belt, right? Since it has huh. that secondary there already. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the only maybe, thing. Sorry. Go ahead. I was about to say maybe try. Uh, um, Maybe try upping the uh, the dex roll or the uh, increased attack speed. Yeah, I mean, even the critical hit damage, it's only 6%, but it might yeah. it might end up being more damage down the road. Mm-hmm. Hmm. hmm. Were, there, were there any other good uh, secondary benefits that you can get on a belt? I didn't think that you could get, um, like, the melee damage and such on the belts normally, can you? Uh, I think... You can. I know, well, I know for certain that it rolls for, like, certain Crusader belts. Like, the Belt of the Trove always rolls with 7%, or 6 to 7% melee reduction. Mm -hmm. So maybe, uh, I don't know if that's specific just to that belt for Crusaders, or if it's uh, an affix overall. But that yeah. could be something. There's also um, Chance to Freeze, but you need, like, a really, you need a skill with a really high proc coefficient in order to get that to be of any benefit to you. It's only, uh, the it... highest roll is, like, 5% or so. Yeah. And not, I mean, again, Demon Hunter, um, at the moment, Cold is uh, still king for Marauders. So, you know, I guess even though it would be like the minor chance to freeze, not really um, that big. Right. You're going to be see, you're going to be slowing and CCing everything. Anyways. Um, yeah. yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Things to, things to think about. It. Uh, it's pretty, I, I think that when you're at the point where it's like, I don't really know what's roll, then you have a good item. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. All right, so leaving from there, we're just going to go into our highlight of items as we usually do. Um, this one was submitted by 3 Days JPT. He's actually been having a lot of fun on his support crusader, rolling that in groups. And this is a final witness, which is pretty much the shield for support crusader. It has the legendary power of making shield glare hit all enemies around you. So normally it just kind of hits a mm, 
not even one i guess kind of 180 cone in front of you um but this actually makes it so it's a 360 uh, effect and it's really good for spreading that damage bonus from shield glare when you use it with uh, divine verdict and the other stats on here are 960 strength a uh, rerolled 111 resistance to all elements and this is of course an ancient uh, final witness 17 percent life and reduce cooldown by eight percent so pretty much all the things that you want there uh, we move on to our next item which is an Ouroboros and this one was actually given to us by uh, Sebastian Seb from mm -hmm. earlier who had the question on the stash space stuff he said that this was actually the world's best I believe uh, Ouroboros until mm -hmm. someone else found one that had like <laughs> another point of resistance better yeah it was uh, 189 poison resist yeah, which is just crazy, because this thing is super good, man. It's mm -hmm. 20%. Sorry, go ahead. I was just about to say, everybody go out and get your jars, because the jelly is about to start overflowing in uh, in the show right now. <laughs> get them ready. Yep. Oh, uh, yeah, so we got the Ouroboros here. 20% fire damage, so that's maxed out, and that's a natural roll. Then he re-rolled on 100% critical hit damage, which is just a feat in itself normally. Um, a 10% critical hit chance native there and a native socket as well. And then you go into your secondaries and he's got poison resistance at 183. And this is an ancient Ouroboros, of course. Um, and then a reduced damage from range attacks just for the kicker, 6%. So it's got like every affix on there is useful and very good. Pretty, pretty yep. nuts. Yep. That is what, what more can you say about that amulet? It, it speaks for itself. It really does. There's a reason why it was rank one at one point. <laughs> yeah. And now, unfortunately, it's rank two. And you know what they say. If you're not first, you're last. Yep. So might as well salvage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. And then we're moving on to our amulet game. We've got Captain Crunch's Mars Kaleidoscope here. 692 strength. This one is not ancient. 97% uh, critical hit damage. 9.5% critical hit chance. A secondary of monster kills grant plus 159 experience and of course that legendary power that makes you immune to poison damage and in fact heals you instead and the thing to note about this guy is nothing has been re-rolled re so you could actually take the strength off and just put your element of choice on there and then use this for any class yeah that, that is actually what i was about to suggest i read your mind mm -hmm. we're that you did we're basically it's almost one. It's almost like that's like the golden standard of how you should be rolling high-end amulets. Almost. <laughs> it's like we know how to play this game a little bit. Ever so slightly. Well, I don't. You do. I just copy you. <laughs> I don't... I'm not a professional at this game. I just play one on TV. Ooh, I like it. Let's see here. Next up is another item from Captain Crunch. It's an Ancient Furnace. And again, I have my standard of if you submit an Ancient Furnace, it will be shown. Uh, so we have a 4,208.6 DPS Furnace. Uh, he rerolled a 10% damage affix onto here. It's got 1,340 Intelligence, 1,454 Vit. And uh, again, some monster kills grant plus experience on that secondary and a 49% damage against elites roll there out of 50. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can't neglect the use of a Happy Meal to roll that Ramalama Ding Dong socket. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm loving it. That, that is definitely a thing of beauty. Yeah, man. Being for an int class, um, did they say what class they played? Uh... That's probably in the email, but I don't have it in front of me. Okay. Because, yeah, it's like if it was uh, uh, for a witch doctor, you know, if you're playing softcore, you know, there, there would be, um, you know, I guess a little bit of idea to reroll the vitality as cooldown reduction if you wanted to use this for a uh, jade build. Um, but, like, if for the jade build, you also want that ridiculous amount of vitality in order to keep you alive. Yeah, and it also depends too. Like maybe what he rerolled to get the ten percent was a socket, you know. Mm -hmm. So then you reroll that. It basically is like you, you either keep that and lose your free affix, and then reroll the vit to that CDR, or you reroll the socket and then you get your free affix and then just put the socket back on. Yep. So things to consider. 
Next up is another ancient furnace because we doubled it. Yeah, because we doubled it. <laughs> Just for you. This one's from No Duologist, which I don't know if that's an actual like position. I know geologists exist and dentists exist, other words that end in ist. Um, but if a no duologist is something, I want to know about it. Uh, this, <laughs> again, back to the item here, this is an ancient furnace, 4,503.3 damage per second. He actually rerolled the base damage on this, get it up to 1867 to 2282, because it already came with a 10% damage affix, 1,444 dexterity, and then the attack speed is what's bumping it up to that beautiful 4,503. Um, he's got an increased attack speed of 5%, and he also has a 49% damage against elites, and a secondary that lets some life after kill do its thing, 15,393, and a Ding Dong for good measure. For good measure. Because why not? It's, why the, not? it's the right thing to do. It is, I guess. I guess. Uh, Nineball, can you guess what the next item will be? I cannot. It's an ancient furnace. Yeah. <laughs> you get an ancient furnace. You get an ancient furnace. Today's right. magic word is furnace. Yes. Uh, and this one hasn't been rerolled at all. This one is currently sitting at 3,985.8 DPS. And it's submitted by Punisher. Um, he's got a decent damage uh, roll, 1698 to 2103 base damage. 7% uh, damage affix, 1,410 int uh, life per hit at 34,006, so I imagine that's probably what will be re-rolled re here. He did use the Happy Meal on it to get a socket. Uh, it's got a low end of the spectrum here on a 41% damage against elites, and the secondary is a Monster Kills Grant 236 experience. Mm -hmm. So, but the thing is, if you re-roll the life per hit, what are you even going to re-roll it to, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that really is the question. I mean, it's an ancient furnace. It's still it's still almost four K damage. Mm -hmm. You know, you could definitely go and you know, um, this this is one of those ones that I'd have to take to a cal uh, one of the calculators to know whether you would get a greater increase by re-rolling the base damage or by re-rolling the damage percentage. I'm gonna guess yep. the base damage because the yeah. that minimum the 1698 yeah. looks really low. I think it goes up yeah. to like 1880 something. It does. Yeah. It does. So it's almost 200 lower than what the the max could be on the low end of the damage. Mm -hmm. But it, but then you know you have 30 the uh, you know the 34,000 life on hit, which could be vitality or cooldown reduction. That's true too. Yeah. So it's it's one of those ones. It's. It still obviously is a damn good item and it's probably going to be better than anything else that you'll find for the rest of the season unless you find a better Ancient Furnace. Well, yeah. funny you should mention because uh -oh. Punisher also submits an Ancient Torch. Yay! <laughs> Something different. Some people have all the luck. Uh huh. Um, this in in blah, this Incense Torch of the Grand Temple has 4,278.9 DPS. Uh, it came with a 10% damage bonus on there. Uh, 1,239 dex, reduced cooldown naturally on there at 6%, increased wave of light damage at 28%, reducing the spirit cost of wave of light by 43%, and then actually a nice secondary of 29 max spirit. And he used the, another Happy Meal Ronald McDonald's on here for the socket. So nothing re-rolled on this one as well. Yeah. No. Oh. There's, I don't know. There's not a lot that you really could need or want to re-roll on this one. Seriously, I mean the the CDR is only two percent off, or no, sorry, four percent off max. So maybe that's something to consider because it does go to ten percent on weapons. Um, the damage, the base damage, seventeen fifty to twenty one seventy six. Those are getting closer to their maxes. So I don't know. <laughs> There's, I guess that would be it because you already have the ten percent. Just get more damage out of it. Go up to like forty four hundred. Yeah, good try. It'd definitely try but yeah that brings us to the end of our lovely items of the week uh, obviously there were a lot more there than usual uh, i was just kind of catching up on the backlog and we did get some recent submissions so those will be ones to look forward to next episode and again if you do want to contribute to those segments west march workshop at blizzpro.com send us your feedback or items or anything that you would like to discuss with us we're ready and willing 
You can also tweet at us, the WM Workshop, or catch us in game at our community, uh, West March Workshop. Mm -hmm. Or join our clan, the BlizzPro clan. There you go. Mm -hmm. So many ways of getting in touch. And we're everywhere all at once. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Jesus, who will be coming back to us on Sunday. Yeah, I was actually going to go through and say like an electron existing as a field of probabilities in a waveform, but yeah, that one is probably <laughs> will go over a little bit better. <laughs> will it though? I just force religion upon people. I don't know about that. Oh, this is America, don't you know, where everyone is entitled to any religion that they want to, so long as it's Christianity. <laughs> Guns and Bibles. Guns and Bibles. Guns and Bibles. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess we're at the end of our show here at this point, since we're, we're already ribbing into after hours type stuffs. Anything you want to leave the people with besides their right to freedom of religion and speech? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, going, going. We're going off the deep end early on this one, but mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's that. That is about it. I look forward um, to uh, next week, where, where we're going to be in serious season three prep mode. Also, uh, I don't think that we mentioned on the show. We have talked about it on Twitter a little bit, um, but we'll be uh, teaming up with Minerva and um, uh, another member for the season three launch we'll be starting a little bit late i think we're going to be starting uh an hour after launch so around that's going to be i think like 10 o'clock yeah um yeah 10 o'clock or Eastern. So. yeah seven o'clock pacific somewhere around that time frame um and we're going to do our usual grind all night quest to 70 oh yeah um, so yeah definitely look forward and uh check us out then as well and of course as we announced at the beginning of the show um, save the date, April 15th. We'll be having uh, Wyatt on the show to join us to have a nice little conversation um, and uh, have some fun hanging out, That's right. talking about Diablo. Talking about this thing that we love to do every Wednesday night. Yeah, um, I'm right with you, man. Super excited for uh, Series Prep Mode Season 3. Looking forward to seeing what we can do with this last couple of days in Season 2 as well squeak some things out hopefully get that lore achievement for yourself hopefully i can climb some greater rifts here at the end but yeah um it's been an awesome show so thank you guys for joining us for episode 44 one year of west march workshop here's to another huh here is to another year yeah man i look i look forward to having this conversation with you april of uh 2016. there you go man likewise so yeah, like I was saying previously, follow us on Twitter, WM Workshop, or independently, I'm SA Stewart 111 My beautifully bearded friend is a nine-ball gamer on Twitter. Uh, again, you can also catch us in-game, where we will be for the next few days, of course, grinding our things out in Season 2. That's at the West March Workshop community, you just search for it. Uh, what else? We're also on BlizzPro, we'll be writing articles, diablo.blizzpro.com, be sure to check that site out. Lots of good stuff going on there. Lieutenant Lunatic doing his Transmog Tuesdays. So you should definitely check that out as well. Um, and yeah, you know, we'll just be around. We have awesome events coming up that we're super stoked for, super excited for. Uh, save the date April 15th. Save the date April 10th. Save the date April 8th, 6 p.m., which is the next episode of the West March Workshop. And we'll see you then. Later. <laughs>